All right, so I've had a few videos so far where I talk about stems in some capacity or another, so I figured today I would actually show you how I tend to print stems. So first of all, this session that I have open is my friend Monse's session. The song is called Come Home, and it's going to be released on streaming. It's set for artist release soon. It might not be released by the time I post this, but I might not play it anyway just because I don't want the content ID system to flag me once she does release the song. So I'm going to be showing you um, how I would print the stems, but we're probably not going to actually listen to the audio here. But I did the other day print the stems for this song. So they're already done. I've already printed them. And what I did is I wrote in my notebook every single step that I did so that I could show you all how I'd print stems and not forget any of the steps. So I guess I'll just look at these notes and walk you through it. All right, so the first thing that I do is actually pretty boring, but it's to create a folder within my bounced files folder for the stems. So I have come home, stems, and final mix. And so I have the final mix in here. That's this file here. I have everything labeled properly, right? And then these are the stems I ended up making. So I made a bass stem, background vocals, drums, lead vocals. I had a little music box instrument in the beat there. I have a sound effects stem, which is mostly like low stinger sounds. I have a synth stem, and then I have a voice synth, which is um, one of my Nexus instruments. So it's a virtual instrument um, that I played, you know, with my MIDI keyboard and it's like a voice-ish. It's like a very artificial sounding voice. So that's what I made for my final stems. But if you're printing stems yourself, the first thing I would do is make a folder for them so that everything kind of stays organized and you don't just have like a bunch of bounces in there with all your like different iterations of the song as you were creating it, right? So I create a folder. And then the other thing that I do is I will do a save as, and I will save as do an underscore stems print at the end of the name. And that's so that I have a separate save as for my Pro Tools session. And if, for example, we suddenly decide that we wanted to make some kind of a change to the mix, I could go back to the version of the mix that was the final version of the mix without any fiddling with things for the stems. And I know that that is the actual final mix that I am working from and not something that got potentially changed with the stems print. Because um, as you'll see, I'll be changing a lot of things with the stems print just to get each thing isolated. So I... Um, just to be safe, just in case I would forget something, right? I like to do underscore stems print for the name. And then the other thing that I do is I will set start and end markers. So usually I'll have done this much earlier in the process. Uh, it is very unusual that I get to this stage of the game and I have not already set my markers for the beginning, all the different sections, chorus, verse, bridge, et cetera, and then the end as well. But you just want to make sure that you have start and end markers and that they're precisely located. So you want to listen through, make sure you get, you don't cut off any reverb tails. For example, I like to actually automate the master fader down to total silence so that I know I'm not cutting off a waveform when it's like slightly off from zero. Um, because that's when you get speaker pops, right? I also like to, what's my start marker? It's probably two on the session. I also like to set the start marker and do a little fade in there as well. And I like to leave a little bit of a gap before the beginning of the song. So I was taught to leave about like, I was like a quarter of a second or something. Let me set this to minutes and seconds. Yeah, so like 0 0.2, 250 to something before the actual noise starts. Um, and that's just a good uh, practice to have a little bit of a gap there at the beginning, especially if you're doing like a mix and a master, right? So those are some of the first things that I do when I'm starting to print stems. So the next thing that I do is kind of what I think of as session cleanup, session organization. So I'll go through all my tracks and I'll look for any tracks that are inactive in the original mix, right? So things that maybe we thought about adding and then we decided not to, and now the tracks are either completely muted and they're not just muted, but also like sending to the reverb, for example, they're like muted as in we don't have it going anywhere in the session. There's not going to be any audible audio coming from it. Um, and then tracks that are also inactive. So if you look at the session, I've already done this. Um, and so for example, my click and my talk back, let me show them. I'm just clicking the dots here to make them show. So these are inactive, right? If you click, you can see it says make active instead of inactive. Um, and that's a right click to get this menu. Um, so they were, I made them inactive 
in preparation for the stem sprint. So after I did my save as, I went through and I was like, well, I obviously don't need anything from this. So I'm going to do the hide and make an active option and get rid of those. And I want to actually hide them so that I can't see them. And you'll see why in a minute here. Um, I have a few other tracks in this session. So for example, these tracks here were not being used. So I hid them and made them inactive. I have a couple more here. You can see that I've already done this on a few things. So it's whatever you're not using in the session at all, you want to go through and you want to actually hide and make them inactive. Okay, so then I'll go through and I'll think about my plugins. So if I switch here to the mix window, I did command uh, equals to switch the mix window. I'll go through and check all my plugins up here. And if I have any tracks that are frozen, so for example, this track is frozen up until this plugin. So what I did was I right clicked on this and I froze up to this insert at some point. And you can see now they're frozen there. And if you go and you look at this track, this is my base. Let me find it. There's my base. You can see that it's frozen. It has that, um, you know, w generated waveform printed over the MIDI, uh, the instrument track. So um, you can see that that's what I've done. You can see the little frozen icon here that's uh, lit up to indicate that these look this way because they're frozen. They also have the little snowflake icon here. That's another way you can tell. I have a video that's about freezing tracks, so I'll probably put a card and then link to it in the description for you if you want more details on that. But basically what I do, besides making sure that like all my plugins are active the way they should be, everything looks right, I will, um, I will go through and make sure that whenever I have frozen a track, I have not frozen something that needs to be side-chained. So this compressor, for example, is taking from the kick bus. This is side-chain compression. And that's why I froze up to this plugin, but not this plugin itself. So um, I just check for that. And that's because I want everything to be interacting the way I want it to interact, right? The way I plan for it to interact. So I'll just make sure that nothing's frozen that is um, taking input from elsewhere. So for example, side chained, right? So then what I'll do is I have a session that's full of tracks that I am using, right? They're all active and part of the mix. What I'll do is I'll do my drum stem first and I'll show you why it has to do with the kick and the side chaining and stuff like that. But basically I'll take all the tracks that are not part of my drums. So in this example, I'm going to say the this this chime track is kind of the end of the drum section and I'll just go through and I'll hold shift and click and so now I've highlighted all these tracks that are not part of the drums and I'll hold option and then shift to affect everything and I will right click on any one of these tracks and I will make them inactive. So now there's no way they're affecting my drum stem. There's not like a pre-fade or send that's gonna get into the reverb, for example, and mess with my drum stem. I can still have my room reverb included in my drum stem. So this is a technique for having your reverb not as a separate track, as a separate stem, but actually incorporated into each of your, your uh, stems themselves. And so now that I have these inactive, you can probably see why I went and hid any tracks that were inactive in my session, because otherwise, if I had, for example, any of these, let me find one, like any of these tracks that were already inactive in my final mix, I might accidentally make them active again when I went to print that section's stems, and then I would have audio in there that I, that I did not want in my final mix, right? So that's why I hid and made inactive the ones that were currently inactive in my session or not being used in the session really. So then what I'll do is I'll look at the routing for everything and just make sure everything makes sense, right? I'll check any sends, make sure all the sends make sense. These room verbs are going to the room reverb. I'm consciously including the room reverb. So it's good that these are active. These are going. Um, these are my headphone outs, so I don't really care about those. But I'll kind of look at all the routing and make sure it all makes sense. I didn't miss anything. I didn't mess anything up, stuff like that. So these are going out the, to the main left and right speakers. These are going through the drum bus and then eventually out through the left and right speaker. I'll just kind of double check all my routing, make sure everything makes sense, right? And then what I'll do is I'll set the time frame. So I'll go up to my master track. I like looking at it on my master track for some weird reason. But what I'll do, because with stems, we need every single stem 
to start at the same exact location, like to the sample, right? You want to be really precise. So that's why we made these markers here. So if you remember, my first marker in my session for my start point is number two, and my last one is number one. So what I'm going to do on my numeric keypad is I'm going to do period, then the number for the marker, and then period. So I'll start with the, the beginning marker, so number two. So period, two, period, and my cursor jumps to that marker. And then I'll hold shift so that it highlights once I do the next one. And then I'll do period one, period and that highlights all the way to my end. So now I have that highlight for the entire duration of my song and that's how I'm going to choose my highlight for every single stem that I print. So they all will start at the same exact location. And I'm going to be very careful not to move those markers during this process. Um, usually ever. I mean, I probably won't move the marker um, unless I'm in the production stage and an earlier stage in the game. So now what I'll do is I'll go to bounce my stem, right? So I'll go file, bounce mix, um, you can name it, you know, add the date, whatever, um, artist name, I'll label the stem, you know, so this one's drum stem, so I'll leave it that way. And then um, what I will do is I'll check my output, right? So I check the file type is correct, and then I check my output. Uh, I am matching output one, two, output one, two, that's why everything's ultimately going out. That's good. Um, and then I will also make sure that my directory is correct, right? So right now I have gone from the session folder, right, the default bounced files folder, and I've actually chosen this folder that I created earlier, right? So the come home stems and final mix folder. So other than that, I will often make sure that offline is not checked off, and that's because I like to run things through my hardware. If you don't have hardware that you're running through, if you don't have like analog equipment that needs to be run through in real time, for example, then you can check this off and it will go faster than real time. Um, so you don't have to sit there and wait through the whole thing. But I kind of also like listening through it as it goes so I can know that there weren't any mistakes made. You know, I can know that um, at least no massive mistakes have been made, right? So um, then you just hit bounce and you're good to go. I'm not going to do it because I already did this. I'm going to show you how I kind of configure everything else because there are a few things left here. To some extent, you're kind of just um, setting that time frame, doing this highlight like I showed you, and bouncing different sections and making things active and inactive. That's kind of the whole game, right? But there's one more trick that I want to talk about, and that has to do with anything that's like sidechain compression or something similar, right? So in this session, the only type of thing where I have something sidechained is with the kick bus, right? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to make all my drums. I just printed my drum stem, you know, in our little fictional world. I'm going to, I highlighted all the drums here except the kick, and I'm doing option shift, and I'm going to make them inactive, so I'll leave them in the session, right? But I'll make them inactive. I'll leave them visible in the session, but I'll make them inactive. And the reason why I didn't do the kick is because I still want this kick bus. So what I'm going to do here moving forward for everything else in the session is I'm going to hold command and click to bypass this send. You can also right click and... Um, I think you, making inactive is a good way to do it too. Um, but you can click mute if you want, right? You basically want to have this not going to the reverb because then you're going to hear the kick in the reverb with every other instrument stem, right? Um, this is headphones. So I don't have to worry about that. I'm going to leave my kick bus active. And since it's a pre fader send. What that means is if I mute this, now I will not hear the kick in my session, but it will still be sending to all of my side chained, uh, components, right? So that's kind of how I handle that. Now side chaining will be active in my session, but I won't be hearing that kick. And so what I'll do going forward is I'll go through and find the next chunk of tracks that I want to activate, right? And I'll highlight their nameplates, hold shift and click, and then I'll do option shift, right click, make active. Now they're active and no one else is. I'll check their routing, make sure everything looks good for them. And then I'll go through, I'll just make sure everything else is still inactive, right? I'll leave my re reverb on because I kind of want to have the reverb on for these. And then I'll do command equals. I'll make sure my, my highlight is correct, right? If it's gone off, I'll just, again, do that period one period, shift period two period, and then you're ready to bounce. So you can go file, bounce mix, and you can label the stem. I forget what this is, so I'm just going to type whatever. And then I will get rid of that one at the end. I'll double check my output is matching. I'll check everything else, make sure it's going to the right place, do offline if I want to, 
I usually do not because of the hardware thing. And then I hit bounce and that's it. That's how you do it. So yeah, that's kind of it. That's how I've been printing stems lately. Let me know what you think in the comments below. If you see any ways to improve, let me know in the comments below. I um, It's basically a game of cleaning up your session, getting organized, and then activating and uh, deactivating tracks as necessary. And then the big trick is with anything that's side-chained, right? And I think that's about it. That's all I have to say. And so, you know, let me know what you think in the comments below. Like, comment, subscribe, do all that stuff that helps YouTubers. I'd really appreciate it. I have a Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Noise, and you can join for as little as a dollar a month. And we have a Discord server that we're hanging out on. We have a book club on the Discord server that's been a lot of fun. We are sharing mixes with each other. We're posting um, about plugins that we like. We're doing all kinds of stuff on the Discord server. So that's been a lot of fun. That's kind of been my, my big focus for the Patreon lately. And, um, it helps keep my channel independent, so I really appreciate my Patreon patrons. And other than that, I come out with new videos every Wednesday, and thank you so much for hanging out. Okay. I also sell these notebooks on Threadless. They're cato.threadless.com, and you can go, and it has my friend Becca's artwork of this exploded mic diagram. And... Um, there's like different styles of notebooks too. You don't have to get this style. There's one where it's like the ringed ones. I might do that one next because I kind of I kind of want to try both styles. But um, yeah, I don't know. That's my thought. That's my thought. I've like explained this concept to so many people recently. The like phase and polarity and you know it comes into play in a few few different things a handful of different things where it tends to come into play but I've done that so often lately that I drew this and I used this when I was teaching someone and I've just kept it on my desk because uh I don't want to have to redraw it I guess that's why and I've just kept it there and I've actually used it a handful of times now which is kind of cool um I don't know okay I hope you're all doing well Bye.